Well, this morning I invite you to turn with me, not to Romans. For the next several weeks, we're going to step away from the book of Romans, but to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I have thought long and hard and prayed about what to do during this brief summer break, and by God's grace, I've landed on a little mini-series that I trust will be helpful to all of us. I think it's important to understand that all sin is destructive. All sin is destructive to our own souls. It's destructive to our relationship with others. Sin is destructive, obviously, to our communion with God. So all sin is destructive. And yet, it's important as well to understand that certain sins are especially destructive. There are certain sins that are corrosive in a unique way to our souls. And over the next three Sundays, I want us to study three of the most destructive In each case, the sins that we'll look at are not sins that I've decided are destructive. Rather, they are sins that Scripture itself describes as uniquely dangerous. Next week, Lord willing, we will examine the danger of pride, which Scripture says moves God to withhold His grace from us. In two weeks, again, Lord willing, we will examine the sin of lust, the dangerous, destructive sin of lust, which Peter reminds us wages war against our souls. But today, I want us to consider the deadly danger of an unforgiving spirit. And the danger of this sin is that on a number of occasions, Scripture says that God will withhold His forgiveness from us if we are guilty of an unforgiving spirit. I want us to look at what is a profoundly rich passage this morning, Matthew 18, and let me read it for us beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and they came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, two verses, the first two verses, set the context for this remarkable story. Notice verse 21, Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? In the context, 
Our Lord has just taught about church discipline. And Peter has just heard Jesus say back in verse 15 that when those who have sinned and are disciplined by the church repent, we must forgive them and we must be reconciled to them. That's the context. And Peter is trying hard to work out the details of that in his mind. Don't be too hard on Peter. He has learned from our Lord that, in fact, he must forgive those around him. He must extend that forgiveness. And what Peter suggests here seven times was actually, concerning his own culture, quite generous. It was way beyond what was normal. You see, the rabbis in the first century taught that you should be willing to forgive, but there should be limits on that forgiveness. Here's the Jewish Talmud, which sort of encapsulated the the general understanding of the times leading up to when it was compiled. It says this, quote, if a man commits a transgression, the first, second, and third time he is forgiven. The fourth time he is not forgiven. So give them three times, and the fourth time you don't have to extend forgiveness to them. This was based on a misreading, a misinterpretation of a comment in the book of Amos. So Peter, in saying seven times, was being really generous. He more than doubled the conventional wisdom of his time. But he reasoned there has to be some limit on forgiveness. Peter wasn't in the right ballpark. In fact, he wasn't even in the right city. Look at verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, there is some disagreement here about the way to interpret the Greek text. The Greek text allows for two possible translations of the numbers in this passage. First of all, it could mean 70 and 7. In other words, 77. If you have an English Standard Version, that's how it appears in your text. 70 and 7 or 77. Those who take it this way point out that this exact same Greek expression is used in the Septuagint of Genesis 4.25, or excuse me, 4.24. And the Hebrew of that text in Genesis 4 is very clear. It's 77. And so they say that's got to be what Jesus means here. Now, if Jesus did intend to say 77 then understand that he chose this number in order to make a powerful contrast. Because what is the context of Genesis 4.24? It's a poem written by a man named Lamech about his desire for personal revenge. And so by using that same number, 77, Jesus was saying that we should replace Lamech's desire for revenge with an equal desire for reconciliation and an equal enthusiasm to forgive. So it may mean 77. The other possible translation of this Greek expression in verse 22 is 70 times 7, or 490. That's the way the New American Standard takes it. If this is what Jesus meant, then understand he wasn't setting some sort of limit on forgiveness. It's not okay to say, okay, look, I have forgiven you 490 times. I've kept track. This is 491. You're out of luck. Whether Jesus meant 77 or 490, his point was that there is to be no limit on the forgiveness that we offer others. In fact, this becomes clearer in another passage in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 17 Verses 3 and 4, listen to what Jesus says. If your brother repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now, Jesus spoke those words in Luke 17 about six months after the passage we're studying in Matthew 18. He's headed to Jerusalem for the final Passover. But did you notice the key change in what he said? He didn't say 77. He didn't say 490. 
he said, up to seven times a day. And he comes and says to you, I repent, forgive him. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that you and I must be quick to forgive, that we must never withhold forgiveness from anyone who sins against us and who expresses repentance. Now, to drive his point home, Jesus told Peter and the rest of the disciples this remarkable parable. Let's look at it together. The parable that he tells has two basic parts. Jesus began in verses 23 to 27 with a picture of God's forgiveness of us. A picture of God's forgiveness of us. Now, he first reminded us as he unpacks this of our unpayable debt. Verse 23, for this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Life in Christ's kingdom, that is in the spiritual kingdom over which he rules right now, may be compared to a king in the ancient Near East who decided to settle accounts with his slaves. Now notice that word slaves. As, as the story unfolds, it becomes clear that Jesus didn't mean the kinds of slaves assigned to the lowest possible duties in the household. Those were slaves. But in, in light of the size of the debt here, He's probably talking about court officials. In the ancient Near East, even the most powerful government officials were referred to as the king's slaves. And as I said, in light of the size of this debt, it's likely that these slaves were actually the very highest government officials in the land under the king. Men like satraps and governors over entire regions. One of their responsibilities would have been to have collected and delivered to the king the taxes for their region. That appears to be the context of this parable. Now look at verse 24. When he'd begun to settle these accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now the word talent is actually a Greek word. It comes directly into English. It's just transliterated from the Greek text. It's a weight, a unit of measure. One Greco-Roman talent was somewhere between 53 pounds and 83 pounds. So we're talking about one talent of between 83 and, or 53 and 83 pounds of gold and silver coinage. And notice here we're talking about 10,000 talents. A talent was the highest unit of currency in the Greek culture, and 10,000 was the highest number in Greek. Jesus intends us to understand this is a huge amount of money, the most you can conceive of. But to truly get the impact of Jesus' story, I want us to translate these numbers into our modern context, because I want you to see how it would have affected those who heard Jesus that day. Now, one way to translate it into our context is to simply figure out how much money this was then in today's dollars. Some have estimated this would be somewhere around $12 million. But even that, as much money as that is, doesn't fully show the point Jesus was making. So let's look at it a different way. We know how long the average worker in the first century had to work to earn this amount. One talent, one talent was the equivalent for the average worker of 15 years work. One talent, 15 years work for the average worker. That means this man had accumulated a debt equal to 150,000 years of wages for the average worker in the first century. In other words, what the average worker in the first century would have earned in 2,100 lifetimes. That's how long it would take at the average worker's income to retire this debt. But that assumes, think about it, that assumes that he was able to spend every penny of his wages every year to retire the debt. And that assumes there was no interest accumulating. 
you can understand the real equivalent for us. If you multiply the median income in the Dallas area, which is $50,000, if you multiply that times 150,000 years, that gives us the equivalent in today's world. Today, this person we're talking about would have a debt of $7.5 billion. Obviously, Jesus intended to picture an impossible, unpayable debt. But he also wanted to show us that this was not an honest debt. We know from historical records that the total tax income that Rome collected in the entire area of Palestine... Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and Idumea cross the Jordan. We know that the entire Roman tax revenue for a year from that region was 8,000 talents. That means this man had accumulated a debt equal to more than a year's worth of taxes for the entire region of Palestine. There was no way he could have accumulated that much debt through the normal exercise of his job. Even if he was terribly unlucky or, frankly, grossly incompetent. The only way to accumulate that much debt as a governor or a satrap in the first century was through sheer recklessness or embezzlement. So here was a man with an utterly impossible debt, a debt that he had brought entirely upon himself by complete, utter, reckless abandon or by embezzlement. Now, as this parable unfolds, you and I, we should feel very uncomfortable at this moment. Because do you understand in Jesus' story, this guy is you? In Jesus' story, this is me. I don't care how good we think we are, apart from God's grace, this is how God thinks of us. From God's perspective, we have all recklessly squandered his good gifts. We have absolutely wasted them. We have taken what belongs to him, and we've used it solely for ourselves, and frankly, we have used those gifts in ways he never intended. We have embezzled from the God of heaven. We've accumulated an utterly impayable debt with God. Do you understand? Jesus intends to show us that this is the spiritual biography of every single human being. This was our story, believer, before Christ. We were morally bankrupt with a debt we could never pay. There was no way to get rid of that impossible, unpayable debt by any efforts of our own, and we had accumulated it by our utter recklessness with the goodness of God. Verse 25, but since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. This was a common practice in those times. Although there was no hope of regaining the entire amount of the debt, the king decided to get what he could and write off his losses. And so he ordered that the man and his entire family be sold into slavery, and then everything that he owned be liquidated, and the assets given back to the king. It was a kind of short sale. Get what you can and write off the the rest as bad debt. Understand what it was like for this man. This was the utter end of this man and his family and his family's history. He and his entire family would spend the rest of their lives and die in slavery. And likely for generations to come, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren would be born and live and die as slaves. Verse 26 So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now, clearly, in light of the size of the debt, that's completely impossible. But this is all he has to offer. Notice he doesn't even bother saying, Let me make an initial payment. 
because he has nothing, and he knew it. He's completely bankrupt. This is instead a plea. It is a plea and a prayer for mercy from the king. It's like the words of the prodigal son in in another wonderful parable our Lord told. When that prodigal son says, Father, or tries to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, make me as one of your hired servants. He's basically saying, be gracious, be merciful to me. You also, if you're a Christian, can see yourself in this portrait. Because when you came, as I did, when you came to see your moral bankruptcy before God, this is exactly what you did. You threw yourself on the mercy of God. You said, God, be merciful to me. You were like that that publican, that tax collector in Luke 18 who says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I don't have anything to offer you. I'm a beggar in spirit. I'm just coming saying, God, show me mercy. Show me grace. So Jesus then, here in this passage, has described our unpayable debt. Believer, do you understand? This is you. This is me. This is God's perspective of where we were when he found us. But notice, he goes on to describe God's unparalleled forgiveness. God's unparalleled forgiveness. Verse 27, and the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. I wish, I wish you and I had never heard how this story ended. I wish you were hearing this for the first time. You could really get the impact of what this is you'd be utterly shocked if you were hearing the story for the first time because the king's heart is moved with compassion for this man. Remember, this man is not an innocent party. This man is a criminal. This man deserves anything he gets, and yet the king is moved with compassion. And to the shock of the rest of the court, he doesn't follow through on the sentence that he's just passed, but in response to the plea of, for mercy, the plea for grace. Notice what he does. He doesn't even give the man what he asked for. He doesn't just give him more time. Instead, he made two shocking decisions. First of all, notice he ordered this man to be released. So the threat of enslavement, the, the threat of prison, the threat of slavery, it's gone. He's not going to have to endure that, he nor his family. But then, and this is the most shocking thing of all, he says the debt is forgiven in full. He forgave the entire debt, all $7.5 billion worth. Just in a moment of grace, he wipes it away. No conditions. No hesitation, just pure grace. When I graduated from college, I had what, frankly, is by today's standards, a very small amount of debt, small amount of student loans. Uh, I paid for my own way through school because I was the last of 10 kids. I think the, the college fund was used up sometime before I got there. And so, you know, I, I was in school for some eight years with college and grad school. And when I graduated, Uh, I had a small amount of debt, and uh, I remember the heavy weight that that debt was. It seemed insurmountable. And I remember that huge sense of relief when I wrote the last check, stuck it in the mail, and I said to Sheila, we're going out to celebrate. The weight is gone. Perhaps you've had a similar experience. Imagine what it would have been like to be the slave. Imagine what it would have felt like to have been him. He had accumulated a debt that would have taken the average worker's total income 150,000 years to pay, an eternity of debt. And in a moment's time, that unpayable debt is just completely gone. Can you imagine 
what that would be like? If you're a Christian, you can, because that's exactly what has happened to you. Because this is Jesus' picture of what it was like for us to be condemned sinners before the justice of God, to owe God everything, and to be completely in his debt, and to have no way to pay it back, and God declares us to be forgiven. Jesus here is using the image of financial debt as a picture of human sin. In fact, in other places, like the Lord's Prayer, for example, he actually uses the word debt as a synonym for sin. For example, Matthew 6, verse 12, Jesus says, I want you to pray like this, Christian. This is how I want you to ask for forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So you see, debt is a powerful word picture of human sin. How does that work? Every one of us, by virtue of the fact that God our Creator gave us life, by virtue of the fact that He gives us all things, as Paul says in Acts 17, He gives to all life and breath and all things, we owe God our perfect, absolute obedience. Specifically, we owe God this. We owe God to love Him perfectly every moment of our lives, and we owe God loving others as we love ourselves. Those are the two great commands, right, our Lord said? We owe that to God. You owe that to God. And to whatever extent you have failed to do that, i.e. every moment of your waking life, you have accumulated debt with God. You owed Him that, and you've never paid one dollar toward that debt. We, before we came to Christ, this is what you have to understand. Before we came to Christ, we, like this man, were not only in debt. We had accumulated a debt that we could never repay. In this life, even if you were pretty good most of the time, you never repay this debt. In 2100 lifetimes, in eternity, you would never repay this debt because you would continue to accrue more debt because sinners in hell continue to sin in their mind and in their heart. They don't love God. They don't love others. And so it is a relentless accumulation of debt forever. This is what Christ dealt with on our behalf. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 Paul here uses several images of what we have enjoy and forgiveness in Christ. But notice verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. And then here's his picture of that forgiveness. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. Here he pictures the law of God as a promissory note. God says, love him perfectly. God says, love others as yourself. And all of the specific commands that fill that out, it's like a promissory note. And your signature is on that document. That's the handwriting. Your signature saying, yes, God, that is what I owe you. When Sheila and I bought our first property in California, I still remember it vividly to this day. We sat in a small office in an escrow company, and for an hour and a half, we just signed our names. We signed away our oil rights. We signed away our mineral rights. We signed away our firstborn child. <laughs> and I have to tell you honestly, I don't have any idea what all I committed to that morning. I just kept signing. But one thing was sure. We committed to pay a ridiculous amount of money for a condominium that was not much larger than a tool shed. <laughs> and I remember that night lying in bed feeling the weight of that debt. What have I done? 
done. I've committed myself to an amount of money that it will take me years to pay off. Multiply that an infinite number of times, and that is the debt and the weight of debt that we all owe to God. Before we came to Christ, we owed Him a debt that we could never repay. So how then can a just and righteous God just forgive the unpayable debt of sinners? The answer is He can't. He can't. Because God, in His character, demands justice. So how did God deal with this debt of sin that you and I had accumulated? Well, look at the end of verse 14 of Colossians 2. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross. God took the promissory note with the endless record of our debt of sin, our failure to keep his law, and he nailed it to Christ's cross And on the cross, Jesus paid the debt in full. In fact, look at the beginning of verse 14, that expression, having canceled. That's a fascinating word. It literally means to wash or to wipe away completely. Again, this is a a cultural phenomenon from the first century. They didn't have an endless supply of paper as you and I have today. And so the paper would be made through a very expensive and tedious process from the papyrus reed. And that papyrus document was valuable enough that when you were done with that document, you would wash away the writing. You would wipe away the writing so that you could reuse it. That's what Paul is saying. That's what God did with our debt He nailed it to the cross. Jesus paid for it entirely, and the Father washed the document clean. That's only because Jesus himself paid all our debts to God in full. So the first half of this parable, then, is Jesus' picture of God's forgiveness of us. What a remarkable picture. Let it settle into your soul because it sets the stage for the second half or the second part of this parable, and that is a picture of our unwillingness to forgive others in verses 28 to 35, a picture of our unwillingness to forgive others. Now, Jesus begins this second picture in this parable with an unsettled debt. Notice verse 28. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. So the forgiven slave leaves that staggering moment of forgiveness, and either he goes looking for this fellow slave, or in the, in the context of celebrating the forgiveness he's enjoyed, he walks out of the room and he, he runs into this guy accidentally. He happens across him. And this fellow slave, this peer, owes him, notice what it says, a hundred denarii. That is one six hundred thousandth of what he had owed the king. A denarius was a Roman silver coin that was equal to about the average worker's daily pay. So a hundred denarii then was about three months' income for a a normal daily worker in the first century. Now notice that there is a debt that this fellow slave has accrued. Jesus is reminding us here, he's acknowledging that in fact we do sin against each other. And when we sin against each other, just as we accumulate debt with God, we accumulate debt with each other. There are real offenses that happen as we interact with each other. Jesus is acknowledging that. But notice the comparative difference in size. Again, using Dallas's median income of $50,000, this slave who owed $7.5 billion that his master had just entirely canceled, he encounters a fellow slave who owes him $12,500. But the slave's response was an unforgiving spirit. 
Notice verse 28. He seized him, and he began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. You say, what in the world is going on here? Is this like just a physically violent man? No, Roman law allowed a creditor to physically seize his debtor in order to bring him before a judge. You can only imagine how that law was abused. In fact, Roman writers describe creditors twisting the necks of debtors, choking them, and even squeezing them to the the point, their head to the point, that blood comes out of their nose and mouth. So he seizes him. His plan is to take him before the judge, get back what he owes what he's owed. Verse 29, so his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Now, do you see that? Don't miss the irony. This request is almost identical to the one that the first slave had just made to the king. And this is a debt. And it's not a small debt, but it's certainly payable. It's like the, the debt that you might owe for a used car today. It might take several years to squeeze the money out of, out of his income, but this was certainly a repayable debt. And so what he's asking here is not an unreasonable request. Give me time, I will repay it. Verse 30, but he was unwilling. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now, he couldn't sell him into slavery like the king was going to do with him because Roman law didn't allow a a person to be sold if he owed less than the price of the sale, which would have been true in this case. But, But he could be imprisoned. Now, to us, the idea of a debtor's prison seems strange and even barbaric. But it was common in the Greco Roman world. And here was the basic idea. It kept the one who had defaulted on his debt in the area and in the country, and it put pressure on his friends and family to go raise the money between them to pay off the debt so he could be set free. That was the idea. Don't miss the spiritual point Jesus is making here. It is desperately wicked to have been forgiven an impossible, unpayable, almost incalculable debt, and then to refuse to forgive a small debt that is owed to you when you have been forgiven so much. It's unthinkable. You see, and this is how Jesus wants you to think here, he's not denying that we have been sinned against, that people sin against us, and in so doing, create a debt. And sometimes people sin against us in unthinkable, difficult ways. He's not downplaying that either. What he is saying is, I want you to compare the sin against you with the sin that you have committed against God and have been forgiven. Regardless of how badly someone else has sinned against you, it is a small debt compared to what you have been forgiven. Jesus isn't done, though. Notice he turned the parable in verses 31 to 35 into an unforgettable lesson. An unforgettable lesson. Verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and they came and reported. The idea of that word in the original language is they fully reported to the king in detail all that had happened. Verse 32, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Now, the word order in the Greek is this, all that debt I forgave you. You see, the king is emphasizing the sheer size of the debt that he has just forgiven this man. Verse 33, Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? The Greek word that Jesus uses here stresses the moral obligation of showing mercy to others. Literally, we could translate it this way. Is it not necessary for you to have had mercy? Verse 
You are obligated to show mercy to others in the same way that I have shown mercy to you. That's what this king is saying. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Verse 34, And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. The king commanded that this man be imprisoned, that he be periodically tortured until every last dime of the debt was repaid. And as we've already seen, that wasn't going to happen in an eternity. Verse 35, Jesus applies the parable. He he leaves the parable. It's no longer the king of the parable speaking. This is Jesus speaking, and I want you to see his application. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you. Now notice the condition. If each of you, in other words, he says, I'm talking to every one of you without exception. If each of you does not forgive his brother, that doesn't mean in context here fellow Christians, although certainly it it, Uh, would emphasize fellow Christians, but it just means any fellow human being, from your heart. This can't be some external, yeah, yeah, I forgive you, and you retain that bitterness and anger, that unforgiving spirit in your heart. Jesus says, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, notice what verse 35 says, my heavenly Father is going to do to you what the king in the story did to that unforgiving slave. Now, this is hard. Let's first of all make sure we're clear on what Jesus does not mean in this parable. He does not mean that God takes back his forgiveness like the king in the parable appears to do. Remember, it's a parable. It's a story made to make one primary point. You can't press every detail. And so he's not saying that God takes his his forgiveness back. That's never true in Scripture. Number two, it doesn't mean, as some would make it mean, that there's going to be some punishment after death for the Christian, something like the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. That's not what's being taught here either. Nor does Jesus mean that we can earn God's forgiveness in any way. Jesus doesn't mean here that our forgiveness of others earns God's forgiveness. We can never earn God's forgiveness. It's based on the grace of God. It's based on the work of Christ. As Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Christ we have the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. It's based on the work of Christ and the grace of God. So that's not what he's saying either. So what does Jesus mean here in verse 35? He means a couple of things. First of all, he means that we must forgive those who have sinned against us. That's the point. We must forgive those who have sinned against us. Forgiveness, here's how we should put it. Forgiveness, our forgiveness of others, it doesn't earn God's forgiveness. Instead, it is a condition that God places on his forgiveness of us. You remember the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 12? Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It doesn't earn forgiveness. It's simply a condition God places upon his forgiveness. We have absolutely no right. You have absolutely no right to expect God to forgive you when you are refusing to forgive others. That's what Jesus is saying. William Hendrickson writes, Prompted by gratitude, the forgiven sinner must always yearn to forgive whoever has transgressed against him and must do all in his power to bring about complete restoration. Now, just to make it a little clearer, let me me tell you what Scripture demands of us in terms of this forgiveness. Ultimately, Scripture teaches that we owe everyone who sins against us two things. Number one, we owe a spirit or attitude of forgiveness even toward those who have not yet repented. 
a spirit or attitude of forgiveness even toward those who have not yet repented. Our Lord demonstrated this. Remember on the cross, Luke 23, 34, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The believers in Jerusalem express this, especially Stephen in Acts 7, verse 60. You remember, as he's being stoned, falling on his knees, Stephen cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. They weren't repentant, and yet he's saying, I forgive them. Don't hold this against them, God. To have a spirit of forgiveness means that we bear no malice toward those who've sinned against us, that we don't desire revenge against them, that we have extended to them a sense of forgiveness in our hearts. But Scripture not only demands an, a spirit or attitude of forgiveness, but it also demands full personal reconciliation when there is repentance. Colossians 3.13, Forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. How did God forgive you? He forgave you in such a way that there was full and complete reconciliation. And that's what he expects of us as well when there's repentance. When, when someone sins against us and, and expresses that repentance, this is what we're to extend. You say, what does this look like? If you want an illustration, read Joseph in Genesis 50. Read his response to his brothers. Now, let me just make clear here. I don't want to be misunderstood. Forgiveness and reconciliation those things don't erase all the consequences of sin. For example, if a law has been broken, there's still going to be consequences even where there is forgiveness. Or, for example, another example would be a congregation can forgive a sinning leader, but if that sin was disqualifying from ministry, then forgiveness and reconciliation doesn't remove the disqualification. But this is what is true. There must always be personal reconciliation where there is repentance. So this parable then demands that we extend forgiveness to those who sin against us. But it's also a warning. It's a warning against those who will not forgive. And this is really the second point here in this, in this parable for us. If you will not forgive, you will not be forgiven. If you will not forgive, you will not be forgiven. If you claim to be a Christian and as a habit of life continually refuse to forgive those who have sinned against you, it shows that you have never truly experienced God's forgiveness. And if you are a true Christian and you are struggling with spirit, a spirit of anger and bitterness and a vengeful spirit and you're unwilling to forgive, then I can promise you this, God will bring serious discipline into your life. So let me ask you this morning, let's be very personal. I want you to really think in your own heart, is there someone you have not forgiven? Is there anyone you have refused to forgive when they have asked for that forgiveness? Or let's take it a, a step further, because I think a lot of us think we've extended forgiveness because we've said, yeah, okay, I forgive you. But in reality, we haven't truly forgiven Maybe you think you have forgiven someone, but you really haven't. You say, well, how can I know? Well, let me give you some questions to ask yourself. This will tell you whether or not you've truly forgiven them. Do you still hold them personally guilty for that offense? Do you still bring up that offense to them? Do you still bring up that offense to others about them? Do you still choose to reflect on and to meditate on and to think about how they hurt you? Do you still want some measure of personal revenge? Do you want them to suffer for what they have done to you? If you have to answer yes to any of those questions, then it's very possible that while you may have said you have forgiven them, you have not truly forgiven them. So let me ask you, Christian, 
Who has sinned against you most frequently? Who has committed the greatest sin against you in this life? Who has come just one too many times seeking your forgiveness, and as far as you're concerned, they've just used it up? Who owes you the greatest debt? Jesus says, you must forgive as God has forgiven you. You must give what you have received forgiveness. How can you do that? I mean, let's just be honest. This is hard. So how do you get over that hurt? How do you get past that debt that's owed to you? Well, the answer is right here in Matthew 18. Because our forgiveness of others, and this is why Jesus starts where he starts, our forgiveness of others flows out of a deep and profound understanding of the forgiveness that's ours in Christ. So if you're struggling to forgive, what you need to do is meditate on the first half of this parable. You need to think about the forgiveness that you enjoy in Christ. And then you will see the debt that's owed to you in comparison to the debt that you owed God and has been forgiven. And it will be much easier to extend forgiveness to that person. And if you live in a pattern of bitterness, unwillingness to forgive, then you prove you're not truly a believer at all. And in fact, let me just say, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you're the guy in the first half of the story. That's God's perspective of you. You owe him a debt that eternity will not allow you to repay. And you will be paying it, although never paying down on it forever. Your only hope is to do what this slave did in this story, and that's to cry out to the one who created you, who's given you all things for mercy in and through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, as we saw in Colossians 2. That's your only hope. I plead with you this morning to do that. Why would you, why would you hang on to that debt? Why would you suffer the penalty of that debt when the one who holds the debt has offered in Christ to forgive it? Christian, the message of this passage is clear to you. You have been forgiven so much, a huge unpayable debt, so go and extend that forgiveness to others, to those who owe you so much less than you owed God. Let's pray together. Our Father, We thank you for this incredible story that our Lord told that that captures so much of the spiritual realities of our lives. Father, we thank you first and foremost that you are the king and that we are that first slave who has been forgiven so much. Lord, how can we ever thank you for forgiving us a debt that Eternity could never repay. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for that forgiveness that we enjoy. Help the reality of that to grip our souls. Lord, help us to understand that, to think about that, to meditate on that. And Father, out of our understanding of what we've been forgiven in Christ, help us to forgive others. Father, I pray as well for the person who's here this morning who's never experienced your forgiveness, perhaps evidenced by their own unwillingness to forgive all those who've sinned against them. Lord, help them to see. Help them to see themselves in the light of your holiness, in the light of your goodness. You've done so much for them, and yet they have accumulated a massive debt Lord, help them to cry out like this slave did for your mercy today. Father, save them for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.